to Paris Media Tea Time Talks. We are part of Interpol Young Academy and aim to spread the science from young researchers in the community of Paris Media. I am Nada Brandão from the Federal University of Uberlândia in Brazil. And today with me in the studio, we have Mohamed from University of Oslo, Kamal from Ariat University, and our new member, Sara, from University of Poor Pierre de Radour. Today is our last session in 2021, and so, on behalf of our team, I'd like to thank you for your audience during this year. To close 2021, we are happy to have here Anna and Panagiotis. They will present their research findings um, and we appreciate your participation. Please feel free to type your questions in the box on the right hand side. Our first speaker is Anna. She completed her PhD in the Environmental <laughs> Engineer from Oregon State University in 2015. And since then, she has been a postdoc and Australian Research Council Fellow in the Department of Applied Maths at the Australian National University. She focused on microscale physics in fluid porous medium system and topological analysis of 3D image data with applications in CO2 storage and utilization. Anna, please, the floor is yours. Ah, thank you, Anna. Uh, good morning, good afternoon to everyone. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to talk today about some recent results we have from our experimental work at the CT lab at the Australian National University. Okay, so I think that most people attending these tea time talks will already be familiar with the concept of geologic sequestration, uh, but just very briefly, geologic sequestration is a climate change mitigation strategy where CO2 is injected into a porous rock deep underground, displacing the resident brine in a drainage process. And then as CO2 plume moves away from the injection point, uh, brine will re-infiltrate into the rock in an imbibition process. And once you go through a drainage and imbibition cycle, there will be some small bubbles or ganglia of CO2 trapped by capillarity in the porous architecture of the rock. This is also called residual trapping. So depending on injection scheme, for example, if there are multiple separate CO2 injections or if conditions change and injection pressure needs to be increased, uh, there may be regions of the rock that experience multiple drainage and imbibition events. And so that's what we're focused on in this study. And in looking through the literature, there are some contradictory observations on this topic. Basically, some researchers have observed that the CO2 brine porous media system appears to change if you go through multiple drainage and imbibition cycles, uh, while others have observed exactly the opposite. So that is the system behaves consistently even when you have multiple uh, of these injection cycles. And so in this study, we wanted to conduct a new set of experiments uh, and try to pin down more precisely what happens when we have multiple drainage imbibition cycles and how that might impact capillary or residual trapping of supercritical CO2. So we're looking at uh, Bentheimer sandstone. We did four cycles of drainage and imbibition injections with supercritical CO2 and brine. All of the injections were undertaken at the same flow rate, which uh, corresponds to a capillary number of about 10 to the minus 5. Uh, so we're definitely moving into a viscous dominated flow regime. Each injection was at least 25 milliliters of fluid. And for this sample, that corresponded to about 20 pore volumes injected in every injection. Have a movie. OK, so this is a 2D radiograph view of a CO2 injection into the core. Um, at the start, it's a bit heterogeneous and there's some interesting fingering patterns. But as the injection progresses, the CO2 fills up all the pore space becomes well distributed. Uh, and in this experimental setup, all the fluids are injected from into the bottom of the core and all effluent leaves from the top of the core. We used micro CT scanning to visualize the internal structure of the sample. All of the scans were uh, conducted with a HeLa scan acquisition trajectory and in region of interest mode. So that allows us to scan pretty large volumes with a tall vertical extent, um, but we're still able to get a pretty good voxel size in this case, it was 3.75 micron per voxel edge. And each micro CT scan required almost 24 hours uh, to acquire. So with the extra time that's required to actually run the flow experiments, um, pause, let the fluids equilibrate, uh, take the scan and then validate reconstructions, this full experiment took about a month to complete. 
And this experiment was designed to replicate an earlier set of experiments that we had conducted previously. So it's run at the same pressure and temperature conditions as uh, the experiments that were in this earlier paper that we published in 2016. It's uh, with the same brine composition. It's in a sister rock core uh, as those experiments. But this is an entirely different experimental system, it has a different flow configuration, and it's a completely different imaging setup. Uh, so we thought this would provide a good comparison to those previous results. In terms of data processing, it's just your classic micro CT data processing. We scanned the dry rock first, and then of course we take a scan at the end point of every injection process. Uh, and then we can register, combine, and segment the scans together so that we can get a four phase segmentation where we can distinguish sandstone grains, um, some of the clays, and then of course the brine in the CO2 phases. Okay, so here are some of the results. Uh, these are two dimensional uh, slices from the center of the core. Uh, the top row is the phase distribution after the CO2 injection. So that's after drainage, it's also called the initial state. The bottom row is the phase distribution after brine injection. Uh, so that's after imbibition, and that's also called the residual state. So the sequence of experiment went CO2 injection, then brine injection, CO2 injection, brine injection, so on. I have noted the image-based CO2 saturation for each scan at the bottom of the slide. There's a few things to notice here. The initial saturation is roughly 40% for the first two scans, uh, but then it increases significantly for the third and fourth scans. And again, all the flow processes uh, here were conducted at the same flow rate and to roughly the same injection volume. So this isn't due to a difference in flow condition. The residual CO2 saturation increases progressively from cycles one to four. It is interesting to note that we are only really trapping CO2 on the edges uh, of the sample in cycle two. And we think that this is probably because the fluid injection port is at the center of the flow cell uh, and we have a quite high injection flow rate. So even though we do have flow diffusers at the inlet and the outlet of the core, I think we're probably still creating a, a flow distribution where we have a higher flux uh, in the center of the core. And so that's possibly what's creating the trapping pattern. But we do also see that um, as we go into cycles three and four, the trapped CO2 becomes more well distributed and we don't see that radial bias. Okay, so clearly in this experiment, we are seeing that there is uh, some change in CO2 distribution and trapping as we go through these four cycles. You might've guessed from the title of the talk that we suspect that these changes are due to a shift in wettability of the rock as we're going through these cycles. So now I want to show you some other features of the experiment that support this idea of a change in wettability. So here are the measured pressure uh, profiles for each injection. This is the absolute pressure measured at the injection pump. Uh, I have the CO2 injections at the top and the brine injections at the bottom. Um, and for all the results that I'll show, I'll use the same color scheme where the first cycle is in black, then dark blue, light blue, and then the fourth and final cycle is in red. Uh, and what we see here is that the supercritical CO2 injection pressure decreased for each successive CO2 injection, uh, while the brine pressure just slightly increases. So these measurements are also consistent with a system that's becoming slightly less water wet. Uh, in terms of CO2 saturations, and these are measured on the whole core, as I mentioned before, the residual trapped, uh, sorry, the residual capillary trapped CO2 uh, saturation increases significantly as cycle number increases, uh, as does the trapping efficiency. So this means that when we plot our results on a classic trapping curve, um, so that's residual saturation as a function of initial saturation, the data does not follow you know, the classic monatomic land model shape of curve. This is similar to what we observed um, in our 2016 uh, study. We also saw increased trapping with every cycle, although there is a difference between the two sets of experiments in that in this newer set of experiments, we ultimately reach a lower value of residual saturation. Looking at individual ganglia, we observe that the mean curvature of the fluid fluid interface decreases as we undergo more cycles. So that indicates that on average, the trapped bubbles are existing at lower capillary pressures. We also observe that if you look at the total interfacial area of the CO2 uh, ganglia, the fraction of that area that is made up of rock to CO2 area increases. In terms of size distribution, we have relatively large ganglia after the second cycle, 
and that shifts to slightly smaller sizes for the third and fourth cycles. I also have this visualization of a residual ganglia comparing what that ganglion looks like in this one specific location after the third cycle compared to after the fourth cycle. And obviously you can see that the ganglion has grown between the two cycles, but I think the more interesting change is that you can see that um, there are these ridges that are more pronounced after the fourth cycle. This means that the CO2 has intruded further into the corners and crevices of that particular pore body. And this is pretty representative behavior throughout the data volumes. Um, we can see that CO2 is pushing further into the corners, even though we're also measuring you know, decreases in interface uh, mean curvature. So that observation is also supported by network statistics of CO2 occupancy. So for both um, the drainage end state and the imbibition end state, we see that CO2 is occupying smaller pore throats and smaller pore bodies as we go through these cycles. And this I think is the most convincing piece of evidence that is indicating a shift in wettability state in these experiments. And that's the macroscopic contact angle measurements of the CO2 ganglia. So this is a method that was developed by Chen Hao Sun, and he actually gave a talk on this topic in one of the first Tea Time talks. So if you are interested in this method, I would encourage people to go back through the YouTube channel and watch his talk. Uh, but essentially this analysis gives us one contact angle value for every capillary trapped ganglion. And when we look at the distributions of these ganglia after each drainage and inhibition cycle, we see that the peak of the distribution has shifted towards more water wet contact angles. So we go from 46 and a half degrees uh, in the second cycle to a peak of 61 and a half degrees after the fourth cycle. Okay, so I've presented here a range of different kinds of evidence um, indicating that the system is in fact changing over time and that regions of the rock are becoming less water wetting. Potentially some regions are even approaching neutral or CO2 wetting. And so we think that this cycling of CO2 and brine is creating a mixed wet state in this sample. Uh, we do think that this wettability transition that we're observing is very localized and patchy. So this means that certain regions of the rock on the scale of individual pore bodies uh, are maybe becoming more water wet, or sorry, CO2 wet. So these regions are more hospitable to CO2, but we don't think that these regions are very well connected. So there isn't um, you know, a nice continuous preferential pathway that the CO2 can mobilize through. There are a couple of plausible mechanisms that could cause this kind of patchy mixed wet state. So the ones I've highlighted here are fines migration and deposition and CO2 adhesion. And both of these mechanisms have been observed in experiments by other groups, but uh, both operate on very small length scales that we can't resolve visually in scans from these specific experiments. So our ongoing work is looking at modeling how these mechanisms might manifest and see if one is um, maybe more likely than the other. Okay, so in summary, uh, we've shown here a new set of experiments that does support previous results um, showing that uh, there's this evolution of CS2 flow and trapping as we go through multiple drainage and imbibition cycles. Um, we see that residual trapping of CO2 increases significantly as we go through these cycles. And we propose that this is due to a transition to a mixed wet state uh, and we think that if we can better understand how this wettability alteration mechanism is actually occurring, that might allow us to design injections to deliberately increase residual trapping. Um, and the paper on this experiment was just published in an issue just last week. And there's a lot more discussion of these wettability alteration mechanisms, why they may or may not be evident in different experiments. And so if you're interested, please check out the paper. And I'll also just quickly put up a list of the other references I mentioned in the presentation so that people can come back to the YouTube and find them if they're interested in extra reading. And I'm happy to take questions if there's still time. Thank you very much, Anna, for this uh, great talk. Uh, it was a really insightful. Uh, you show an interesting phenomena with challenging applications. So uh, first of all, if there is any questions from the audience, uh, please feel free to write them in the comments. And uh, I will uh, give the, the purpose to the studio here, if there is any question from us. So feel free to, to ask.
I've got one question, uh, Anna. If uh, Sarah, can I ask? Is it okay? Um, yeah, it's okay. It's, it's just really nice, really nice study, Anna. Really wonderful, and it shows uh, variability alteration clearly uh, with the different cycles. Now, I've got two questions, but they okay. They are unrelated. What I was wondering, so we did four different cycles, and uh, each cycle, each scan time, I think it was twenty-four hours. You're leaving the system twenty-four hours. And I'm assuming you immediately start the next cycle, because um, I'm trying to understand why. Like, does does it have to do like with the timing? So, if we let's say if you do the drainage and leave it for four days, uh, would it happen? The variability alteration would happen after one cycle even, right? Uh, do you think this would work this way as well? Um, I'm trying to think back. I think. So the, basically the time period from when I finished the injection uh, to when I start the scan, that remained consistent. Um, you might be right that there, like there's a difference in time from when the scan ends to when the next cycle begins. Um, yeah, I think I, the, something that I'm still struggling to understand is like when exactly does the wettability alteration occur? Like at what point in the process? And I, I have some ideas, but I haven't quite figured out how to um, pin that down yet. So, yeah, I'm not actually quite sure what. what no, the I just, no, no, I was, I was just, would be. And I was just curious about this. Uh, maybe I think in the future, uh, some experiment will tell if we leave the system for long enough, even after one cycle, if we get into variability state. I see many questions on the on the board, so I'll, I'll let other people to ask, but I'll come back to one more question, very small one later on. Sure. Yes. So yeah, in the meantime, we got some questions from the audience. So I'm gonna quickly, yes. So one from Martin Blunt. So is the change in contact angle confirmed by local measurements, particularly in areas with a proposed patchy wettability? So we did do local contact angle measurements, uh, but I didn't, I, I didn't go back and look, um, you know, for individual ganglia. I didn't do the match for individual ganglia. What we did see when we did the local contact angle measurements, just looking at the distribution that's measured for the whole, um, for the whole scan, uh, we didn't see as big of a, a shift in contact angle values based on the local measurements. Uh, compared to the macroscopic contact angle measurements. But we also noticed that the, the ganglia that um, have higher values of macroscopic contact angle uh, values, they have shorter three-phase contact lines, um, if this makes sense. So it means that when you're looking at the distribution of all of the local contact angle values, the that um, that total distribution is biased towards ganglia that have longer three-phase contact lines because you just have more points to take the measurements on. Um, and so this is actually something that we were hoping to look at further uh, in a different in a different paper or a different study, looking at the differences between the macroscopic contact angle uh, method and the local various local methods. Great, thanks. Uh, there's another question from Martin also. Uh, so also why is there no trapping in the first cycle if the system is more water wet than? This is surprising, however, very interesting results. Yeah, so that's also something that um, it was very surprising to us as well. I think it's just that we are at a very high flow rate. So we're at capil or, yeah, capillary number of 10 to the minus five during imbibition. So I think that this is just, um, so high that we're flooding out all of the CO2. We also have a very low interfacial tension under these pressure temperature conditions. And so I think that there's, we're just out of the um, capillary dominated flow regime. Great. And the last one. Okay, so from Gyur Skel Yonku. Uh, so very interesting work, thank you very much. Sorry if I miss, but what was the type of brine that you have used in your experiments and the concentration of the brine? Um, it was uh, potassium iodide brine and it was the concentration of one, one molar 
the one mole of potassium iodide per liter. And that's mostly, um, we chose that mostly for X-ray CT attenuation purposes. Okay, thanks. So if there is any other comments in the studio or questions? I actually had exactly the same question uh, like Martin already asked. <laughs> so he, so it's, it's very well. So, because uh, I was just thinking in direction, because Mart, one of Martin's student, Matt, and you, he did cyclic injection. And if I remember correctly, he didn't see much changes, but it would be nice to come. And also, the if I'm not wrong, the flow direction in his case was the same as yours. It would be really nice to compare the results, but I can't remember if he's done bend timer or not. Yeah. yeah, I think the um, so both both of the alteration mechanisms that I've been considering they're very dependent on um, aqueous chemistry, and so mm -hmm. I think especially pH seems to be a um, a key factor. And so if the experiments are conducted under potentially different pressure and temperature, that leads to different CO two solubility, which leads to different pH of the brine. I think that's possibly one thing that um, could be different between a, a lot of these different experiments. I have tried to do a more systematic comparison of experiments, but there's so many different variables, it's very hard to pin down what exactly, you know, causes some of these things to maybe happen in some experiments versus others. Sure, thank you. Thank you very much. I think there are some other questions on the board. Like, uh, yeah, it, yes, <laughs> your talk was very interesting. So there are a lot of, of comments. Uh, one question for Bo Gao. How do you ensure false equilibrium may be related to Dr. Brun's comment on no trapping in first side? Yeah, so we have a, uh, a fluid mixer um, that's temperature and pressure controlled, and it has a stir bar in it. And so we, we let the fluids mix for 48 hours before we do any experiments. And then the entire experimental setup is temperature controlled and, and pressure controlled. Um, but yeah, I, I have had comments from, um, from other people that maybe we might be seeing dissolution and that could be leading to the reduced trapping during the first cycle. Uh, but I think it's hard, it's hard for me to see how we could um, how we could ensure better equilibrium than we already have. I think we've we've already tried to make sure that the fluids are very well equilibrated before the experiments. Yes. Okay, thank you. More comments now. So from Zaid Janda, uh, following up to Kamar's question, it would be interesting to know if the wettability alteration is just time related or cyclic effect. Yeah, I totally agree. Yes. Um, yeah, absolutely. And we've got also a last comment from Martin Grant. Yes, but Matt Andrew deliberately, deliberately dissolved away all the CO2 and repeated the experiments rather than repeated injection strike. So we have not done this type of experiments ourselves. Thank you, Martin, for clarifying it. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I think this is done for, for you, Anna. So we can move on to the next speaker of the day. Uh, thanks again for, for your talk. It was great. And uh, so I will now introduce our second speaker, which is uh, yes. Panagiotis Karnouvounis. Uh, he is currently a research assistant at the University of Strathclyde in Scotland and has a master degree from Polytechnic University of Milan in uh, engineering, uh, engine, enge, energy, sorry, engineering and a bachelor degree in mechanical engineering from the University of West Attica in Greece. So his uh, research interests involve computational fluid dynamics, carbon sequestration, life cycle assessment and thermodynamics. And uh, today he is going to present his work on assessment of the potential CO2 geological storage capacity of saline aquifers under the North Sea. So then, Panagiotis, the floor is yours. Uh, looks like you're muted. Uh... Okay, <laughs> sorry, sorry for that. So good morning or good evening to everyone. Related to where you are right now. 
Uh, it was an excellent talk for from uh, Anna previously. And nice to, to see that Professor Bland is here because this, uh, uh, this talk I'm going to tell you is uh, under his supervision. Um, so this talk is going to be more uh, uh, higher level, not experimental. I'm going to tell you actually uh, how we can uh, assess um, the potential storage of uh, CO2 in uh, saline aquifers under the North Sea. And what results did we actually had uh, for assessing a, a lot of fields with a, a software uh, um, uh, first uh, introduced by some colleagues in uh, Imperial College London. So uh, first of all, uh, according to the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change, human activity across the globe is uh, responsible for 1.09 degrees of global warming since the pre-industrial era. Uh, while this is expected to increase to 1.5 between 2021 and 2040, according to the shared socioeconomic pathway number one. Now, this will inevitably drive the planet Earth into the uncharted waters of climate change, uh, putting into danger the human population and also biodiversity. Uh, now, this chart in the middle uh, provides a visual representation uh, of the importance of carbon capture storage uh, in the forthcoming decades. Uh, in general, we can retrieve that uh, it is needed from 5 to 30 gigaton of CO2 to be removed per year in order to avert uh, climate change. Okay, so why North Sea? Uh, according to this figure, uh, the CO2 emissions are concentrated in the northern part of Europe. In countries with uh, increased industrial activity, like uh, United Kingdom, Germany, Netherlands, and Denmark, uh, that possess the lion's share of the emissions. Now, in the context of carbon capture and storage, you, you know that the, uh, such localization of emissions uh, requires proximal deposition options to minimize the transportation costs. And that is why North Sea is uh, considered the best solution for initiating uh, storage activities. Okay, the, the model utilized is uh, in this study is called the CO2 stored, is uh, developed initially by colleagues at the Imperial College London, and we did some modifications and improvements in this study. It receives as input the geological data of the selected storage field, the seismic data, as well as uh, the log, well log data, and provides a series of injection mass flow rate scenarios in, uh, in figure, you can see them in figure four. Now, for, for the optimal uh, scenario of injectivity, um, we receive the storage capacity as a function of, uh, of the wells drilled. Uh, you can see it in, uh, in figure five. Uh, this model is uh, considered a powerful tool for estimating uh, storage capacity uh, as it uh, shifts the focus from, from a volume-based uh, approach, from a volume-based prediction. You can, uh, you can see it in the yellow uh, equation. Uh, that ignores the transient pressure increase in the reservoir um, uh, to a pressure-based one that uh, constrains in the injectivity and therefore the, the capacity uh, according to the plant pressure increase uh, in each well inside the, the reservoir. Now, uh, to that extent, we needed to consider several assumptions. I, I, in order to give you an indication, we examined around 440 oil and gas fields and saline aquifers in the North Sea, which required around 2,000, uh, around 3,000 uh, input data. Now, these retrieved from uh, national databases, which are publicly available, and from international literature. On the other hand, uh, some of them were absent, and uh, we needed to, to do several assumptions, to apply several assumptions. Um, so. To that extent, we created a we created a depth chart uh, that uh, shows the reservoir depths that we considered. Uh, also, in closed aquifers, uh, the available area is reduced according to the uh, to the second equation. Um, while the number of wells in a given area are constrained in order to respect the distribution of wells in a, in the Cartesian uh, grid not to overcome the available area of the field, which is not, uh, of course, rectangular. 
Um, apart from that, average values from literature were considered uh, for data like uh, lithostatic gradient, temperature gradient, rock cohesion, and uh, rock compressibility. Now, uh, the results. The results uh, were pretty astonishing, I have to say. Uh, as uh, United Kingdom is able to store in its uh, national territory of North Sea, uh, around 238 gigatons of CO2 in a 30-year uh, period with annual values of uh, 0.8 gigatons. Uh, while in Denmark, uh, we, we, uh, Denmark can store around 3.8 gigatons of CO2 in uh, the next uh, three decades. Um, moving forward. Uh, Netherlands, we can see here, uh, can, uh, we examined in Netherlands more than 100 oil and gas fields, uh, and those are able to store 147 gigatons of CO2. Uh, in the picture, uh, we have uh, selected to present the, the, 30, the 30 fields with a higher capacity. Uh, while uh, the 10 massive Salina aquifers of, uh, of Norway uh, can be stored uh, in, in the 10 uh, Salina uh, aquifers of Norway, can, we can store around 48 gigaton of CO2 in a 30-year uh, span with 1.6 gigaton per year, uh, which is uh, pretty a lot. Now, what I want you to, to keep from this study and what was the, mo the most uh, interesting part um, is uh, these two these two pictures? First of all, in the left one, uh, we have uh, calculated the storage efficiency that uh, describes the volume of CO2 that can be stored with respect to the gross rock volume. Um, efficiency is highly dependent on the reservoir's uh, geophysical characteristics and especially porosity. Um, but uh, this figure gives us uh, an indication of uh, an average efficiency that uh, can be considered close to 3%. Now, uh, figure, uh, the figure on the right, figure 12, uh, presents one of the most important outcomes of this study. The red columns are the 2018 emissions uh, in megatons uh, of the nations considered, uh, while the, the yellow ones are the storage capacity in each country per year. So, indicatively, I will tell you that the United Kingdom can store up to 20 times its current emissions underground, um, which highlights the, the vitality of uh, carbon capture and storage in order to buy out important time uh, to implement also other techniques, um, mitigation uh, techniques, to avert uh, climate change. Uh, finally, to do a, a recap, uh, in, this, uh, in this study, uh, we have examined 441 oil and gas fields um, and saline aquifers. And we concluded that uh, in the selected uh, fields, more than 400 gigatons of CO2 uh, can be stored within a 30 year uh, span. And we, we used around 2,800 input data and we uh, retrieved around 3,200 output results. Uh, the methodology used was a collaboration between uh, between Politecnico di Milano and uh, Imperial College London, from our, from our colleagues there, and moved from a volume-based approach to a pressure-based one, providing better accuracy on the results because now pressure constraints the pressure increase uh, constraints the capacity and not uh, the volume. Uh, the results provide a, a valuable added value to literature as it is the most comprehensive study available to date. Um, to that extent, an article was published in the International uh, Journal of uh, Greenhouse Gas Control. Um, and you can uh, find all the information along with the data sets there uh, for, for further elaboration. Thank you very much. And I'm happy to receive your questions, if, if there are any. Um, thank you, Panagotis, uh, for, for this fantastic overview and comparing uh, different countries and how much potential we have in terms of story capacity, and it's impressive to see we can handle actually in the UK quite a lot. Uh, to the audience, if they have any questions, please type into the uh, chat box on your right hand side. I've got uh, one small question. I can start, then I can ask the studio to follow on if they have. Uh, you, you mentioned when you're talking about uh, the dependence, how you uh, get these storage efficiencies, and they're dependent on porosity. 
but I'm also assuming that it's also dependent on the pore structure and uh, many different parameters. Of course. And uh, for different, okay, different rocks, they are different scenarios. But I was just curious about the modeling part. So each each rock has its own heterogeneity inside it. So do you, do, does it kept, is it captured inside those models? The heterogeneity it's itself inside the rock. Let's say we're talking about Bunter. Uh, do you have any comments on that? Well, uh, the model actually uh, wants as input the the porosity of the selected um, of the selected that is measured in the selected field, um, and the permeability and other geophysical characteristics like rock cohesion, uh, etc. Uh, so that that is actually what uh, determines the, the the storage efficiency. Um, yeah. Okay, well, thank you for that. Anybody else in the studio has questions? I had one, but it was actually related. My question was on the input data you you used to perform your studies. Uh, and I was also wondering if there are kind of morphological data you put inside, uh, but you have also answered it, so that's fine for me. Yeah, in general, the, the, the data required were site-specific. Um, so we, of course, in, in the paper, you can uh, also read the other assumptions that we make. And, and it's important to, to tell because um, even if, for example, uh, the two fields were uh, belonging in the Bunter sandstone formation, we and, and uh, some uh, data about the porosity or the permeability was uh, absent in one of, of each. Uh, we actually considered uh, assumptions and we said that, um, you know, it's uh, in this case, we consider uh, the previous fields, field A, for example, um, data for porosity and permeability because they belong in the same uh, formation. Or, yeah, the set of assumptions were, am uh, were amazing because uh, actually the, the data were, uh, were a lot and not all of them were available in literature. Thank you. Um, I've got just a follow-up question so, because it looks like you've analyzed quite a lot of number of wells there. And I was wondering if the data is available, like open access, or where did you get the data, all the data from? Uh, so did you collect from the literature or did you have other sources which are open access, which people can access to? Uh, yeah, actually, um, there is uh, whatever we collected were open source from books, uh, from, uh, from literature, from uh, databases online. Uh, the Netherlands keeps a very, very good uh, database uh, on, their, on their oil and gas fields. Uh, Norway keeps a very good database uh, online for uh, its saline aquifers, uh, but not a lot of data about the uh, oil and gas fields. And uh, United Kingdom, Actually, it's uh, the best database that we uh, we have encountered, um, and uh, there you can find every data as you want for for all the fields. Actually, for more than when, what we considered, we ha we could consider more, but uh, we were interested only. You know, we had to put some boundaries, and um, we said that whatever it is in the North Sea. Okay. So yeah, the databases uh, are online, open source. Also, we we I plan to um, to, to upload the, um, all the data we have for the, for the fields uh, online. Oh, that's excellent. I think that's yeah. very useful for the researchers. And may okay. I ask one last question, Kamal? Sure, absolutely. Go. Uh, for, for example, for Norway, I know that there is a CO two storage atlas prepared by the Norwegian Petroleum Directorate. They are mapping the whole uh, North Sea and Norwegian Sea subsurface, and they are proposing some storage capacity and candidates for the CCS purposes. Uh, did you perform any benchmarking or comparison between those data, and do you have any insight to add on to that? Yeah, exactly. Uh, we we did benchmark in the paper. You can uh, you can also find the benchmarks. Uh, in Norway, we had um, around. 10% uh, discrepancy between uh, the results we get uh, with the results uh, provided in this uh, atlas. 
Um, yeah, but uh, this is not the case for, for every for every field we examined. Uh, so in UK, we tended to have uh, larger discrepancies. I remember in some uh, brand formations, the discrepancies would be more than 20%. So yeah, there's a, there's a lot of discussion on that. And was that it because example. of the volume versus pressure uh, limitation, this criteria that you put because of the volume calculation and uh, yeah. pressure calculation, was it because of that or was it? Yeah. To, to my understanding, uh, yeah, it, it was uh, based on that, based on the methodology, uh, because the data, uh, the, the input data were were alike, and uh, the methodology is what differs. In uh, in general, by by using a, a pressure based uh, approach, uh, we expect that we have less capacity available than in volume based approach. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, anybody else has questions before we wrap up? If not, uh, I'd like to thank you, Panagotis, uh, for, for this fantastic talk and discussion. Thank you. And uh, with this, uh, we would like to wrap up the session. And uh, this, this is the last session of this year. So we'll take a break and enjoy and go for holidays, vacation. And we'll come back on the 1st of February on Tuesday with new talks, new themes, and with a new spirit. So with, till then, enjoy. And uh, uh, this is our team. And if you have any comments, uh, please post and send it to our email address on porosmediatttt at gmail.com. OK, then enjoy. And we'll see you in February. Thank you from all the team members. Thank you. Bye.